Is it possible that the various religious traditions of the world actually point to the Jesus of the Bible? In this episode, I interview Dr. Matthew P. John, the author of The Unknown God, A Journey with Jesus from East to West, all about that question. Stay tuned. Welcome to Theology Breakdown, which is all about life, God, and the Bible, where we seek to really um, break down the transforming themes of theology in an accessible format. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have one of my good friends on today, uh, Dr. Matthew John. And uh, he just released his book uh, right here called The Unknown God, uh, A Journey with Jesus from East to West. Uh, it, it's a fascinating book. Uh, it's uh, hard to put down. I, I really enjoy it. I'm not just saying that because he's a friend. I've always enjoyed my conversations with Matthew. Matthew. Uh, and of course, he's got a great family, uh, his wife, Joanne, and his two daughters, uh, Hannah and Emma, uh, just uh, wonderful people. And uh, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Matthew and just to kind of give you his bio here. Uh, Matthew John considers himself a citizen of the world, originally an electrical engineer from the East India. He pursued a successful corporate career in the Middle East and eventually transitioned from technology to theology in the West which is Canada. Uh, he holds a master's degree in theological studies from the University of Toronto in Canada and a PhD in intercultural studies from Fuller Theological Seminary in the States with a specialization in film and theology. Matthew is a creator of the Mosaic Course, an online platform for exploring world religions from a Christian perspective. Matthew has acquired over two decades of professional experience in various academic, corporate, and ecclesiastical platforms. He has taught courses in theology, film, and culture, and presented papers at academic conferences hosted by American Anthropological Association, Center for Religion at UCLA, and many others. Uh, Matthew, it's uh, so great great to have you here. Uh, here we are in June 2020, uh, still in the midst of social distancing due to COVID-19. Uh, Matthew, thanks for joining us today. Oh, my privilege, uh, Josh, uh, since you mentioned our friendship, and I wanted you to know that when I came to Toronto, you were always, you, you were way younger than I am, but uh, you were always the forerunner, you know. I remember asking about people who are doing theology and, and oh, there is this guy, Josh, who is the one who is pursuing this in the academic hmm. route. So, uh, so I was kind of following you in some <laughs> perspective. And also, since you mentioned my wife, I have to mention your wife too. I taught your wife in Sunday school, okay? Uh, you should ask her. so yeah she is. has a lot of respect for you she has a lot of respect for you uh, when she heard that we're doing this she was excited as well yeah. so uh yeah well yeah. The feelings now we got that out of the way <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. well, well, well tell me what, tell me what life's and ministry have been with uh, been like uh during this time of social distancing you're you know i'm in uh in canada and the toronto area you're in california and the states uh, tell me what life and ministry has been like uh so far the past uh, number of weeks and months yeah um i am currently working as a pastor of missional outreach in a, a relatively big church we have around 3000 members it's an iconic church here in los angeles called lake avenue uh, church which is right next to fuller seminary actually fuller seminary started from lake avenue church um obviously we have transformed everything migrated to online platform we have online services but one of the really cool things that we are doing is um, we do like every Wednesday, we have a prayer service that is streaming regularly. And we also have set up, uh, you know, online um, resources where people can volunteer, people who are vulnerable, particularly senior citizens who need help. Uh, so there are a set of people who are willing to volunteer. There are another set of people who need help. It's all processing online. And so it, it is interesting, you know, ministry in, uh, in so many ways is reinventing um, and reimagining uh, missions uh, itself in this. Uh, and, and I can wait to see how it is going to unfold in the post COVID world. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. That's pretty neat. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so you got a lot on your plate, pastoring, uh, doing uh, writing, academic work. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, writing is something I did in the last 12 years of research. It culminated in, into these two books, which I have, uh, which was released by David C. Kirk. Um, I am not doing any writing right now. I can't. I may have to take a sabbatical <laughs> to, do, to do writing. Yeah. You sure. Know how it works. Oh, yeah. for sure. It's a lot of work. Um, yeah. So, you know, talking about your book, uh, The Unknown God, uh, mm-hmm. a journey with East, uh, w- journey with Jesus from East to West. Um, in this book, you journey uh, with, uh, through six major world religions and show how a variety of religious figures, as you say, surprisingly point to Jesus of the Bible to strengthen Christian faith. Uh, you know, you talk about Hindu avatars to see gurus to the Jewish Messiah. And it is super fascinating. Uh, I really love reading it. I'm not just saying that once again because I'm your friend. Um, you know, I encourage everyone to get a copy of it. Um, you know, whether or not you agree with it or not, you will be challenged uh, to think very deeply about the intersection of Christianity and uh, other major world religions and how you understand how God reveals himself in, in our world. Fascinating stuff here. I mean, this, it, it, it's, it's, you know, you would think a book like this would be like 600, 700 pages, but you know, you've condensed this to, you know, I, I got this kind of ending here, just a, just a little over two, uh, under just a little over 200 pages. That's what the, uh, you know, with the notes and uh, there, you've unpacked quite a lot in a short book. And it's very accessible. And, you know, a lot of people aren't able to do that sort of thing with when it comes to the writing, you know, and with theology breakdown, what what I'm doing here is I really want to, you know, see theology in an accessible format. And that's what you've done, uh, which is, uh, you know, kudos to you. And, you know, each chapter, you know, looks at these different religions and how it connects with Jesus, which is super fascinating. Um, I'm amazed at the amount of material here. Tell me about your journey. You know, you talk a journey with Jesus from East to West. Tell me about your journey about, you know, first off, let's say, let's go to the why of it all. You know, why did you go about writing something like this? Yeah, um, well, uh, first of all, in my ministry, as as you read out from my uh, uh, resume, (laughs) um, uh, that was quite detailed. I didn't think you were going to go all the way, but uh, my transition to ministry happened in Canada. Right. I'm a Canadian, by the way, even though I live in California right now. Uh, so uh, this was 20 years ago when we immigrated to Canada. I had the switch from technology to theology, and I was working for Stone Church downtown Toronto, uh, as you probably know. And um, I, I realized that um, in the postmodern, post-Christian, post-everything world we live in, um, you know, th- see, Josh, when I grew up in the 80s and all that, the main question was about um, how do we make sense of faith from a rational perspective? You know, the, the main question was about science and faith, you know, whether God exists or not. This was the main question. That question is still there, but, but now, uh, you know, the so-called nuns, right, particularly the millennial who are against such, who doesn't believe themselves to be, uh, you know, categorized as nuns per se, they are not atheists, right? Like they are spiritual, but not religious. Mm. So there is this increased interest in spirituality, but at the same time, uh, the, the, the argument shifted from a rational perspective to moral perspective. I'll, I'll explain what it means. See, now the major question I face in my ministry, particularly from the younger generation, millennial and down below, is not about whether God exists or not, uh, but how can Christians say that Jesus is the only way? Yeah, yeah, God may exist, right? Like, you know, yeah, there might be. But look at these people from different parts of the world coming together to form this multicultural mosaic, right? Um, how dare you Christians, and particularly, unfortunately, in the Western world, Christianity is ca- considered a majority religion. So with every majority religion come with the, the all historical baggage of oppression and, you know, uh, all this cultural trigger, trigger word, it is considered as a white people's religion and then the all racial issues coming to this. So, so the argument to me shifted from the, the realm of reason to the realm of morality. It is it's not about whether God exists or not. How can Christians say that there's Jesus is the only way, right? 
um, so so that that's where my journey began right so what so the the one sentence uh, premise would be of the book and the course we developed which is actually accessible for free by the way it's online oh. it's called yeah triple w dot the mosaic course dot org okay um, you. so you you get the taste of all these religions uh, you know from a christian perspective um, so the 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 fundamental premise of this is jesus is the only way to god but can there be more than one way to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Now that's the that's the twist in the <laughs> in the argument, right? Yeah. Because there are around forty thousand or so denominations, Christian denominations, according to Gordon Conwell Seminary. There's forty thousand or so mm -hmm. denominations who all claim some kind of exclusivity to this one Jesus, right? So what if there is another way to Jesus that we don't know of? right can can people come to they have to come to jesus so if i say that there is more than one way to god then it is universalism hmm. there is only one way to god that is jesus otherwise you know the conversation is is in a different route but like in acts chapter 17 you see you know paul goes to athens and he talks about the unknown god of athens right and then he is uh, he's basically using that unknown god as a pointer and he's even quoting from their sacred scriptures, which is which we will consider pagan. Uh, you know, one of the favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, you know, in Him we live, we move, and have our being. is is not actually a Bible verse. It's actually he's quoting from a pagan literature. But we yeah. all use that in our prayer because right. it's a beautiful verse, right? Yeah, yeah. So what I did, you know, to to sum up, what I did was I did a journey through the six major living religions. So, well, six means including Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the other five non-Christian religions, you see this hidden revelations of a Christ figure or like this unknown God who can point them to the Jesus of the Bible. So can we start the conversation with Jesus they know before we talk about the Jesus we know? Wow. Yeah, because all these people, you know, you know, you, you, you live in Toronto and you engage automatically the fact that you are in, you, in Toronto, you engage with people of other religions and other cultures. And if you talk to people of any religion, they have a very respectful, if not reverential, understanding of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, including atheists. Nobody will say that Jesus is a mad guy, like you know, he's crazy, you know, you don't no, they, they have problem with Christianity, obviously, you know, always. But but Christ is respected in, in pretty much all religions. It, obviously, their revelation is not full. So can we use that as a bridge? The Jesus they know. As a, can we start the conversation about Jesus with that premise? You know, let's talk about the Jesus you know before before I talk to you about the Jesus I know. So that's where it became a more a model for evangelism in a in a postmodern uh, society. Yeah. yeah. So so that that was the why of it. So I okay. wanted to I wanted to have that point. Yeah. So would you say that this began in Toronto? like in light yeah, of that very, very okay so. yeah very holistic so. context, yeah. Um, yeah it was brewing uh, you know i came to toronto in 2000 <laughs> uh, i would say uh, to go into detail uh, you know there is this church in avenue road which is a Hare krishna uh, temple right now i don't know if you know that it used to be a church i think uh, i've been there yeah yeah, yeah at avenue road uh, i and when i saw the Hare krishna building board in that church uh, I thought I realized that man, I'm here to 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 engage this culture because I'm coming from the world of Hare Krishna, mm. and the, <laughs> there is a reason I, why I'm here as an immigrant. Yeah, so I, I was this was you know I started studying world religions and then you know I went to seminary obviously and then uh, 2008 is when you know I I realized that I need to resign and I need to engage this full time. So from 2008 onwards, I was developing this Mosaic course. I've offered that, in that course, uh, which is like a seven-week course on six different religions. And in the end, we, we kind of state how Jesus is the only way, having known all this fact, right? Hmm. So I've offered in many churches in Toronto. 
uh yeah toronto we officially started our ministry in 2011 at bayview glen church in toronto mm. next to tindale yeah uh, philip yancy came and he uh, he uh, inaugurated the whole ministry i was there and, i remember that yeah of course I was in attendance, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and 2012 we moved to um, California because I wanted to do the my PhD program here at Fuller. So we started here in um, in the U.S. our branch, and then David C. Cook came along, and uh, David C. Cook is a is one of the largest publishers in the evangelical world, and you know they publish people like Francis Chan, and you know I'm we, we are kind of a nobody. I'm I'm not a I'm not a celebrity speaker. I don't even have a Facebook account. I don't have a Twitter account. <laughs> so, um, or you don't but, use it. <laughs> what is that? You have one, but you don't use it. Yeah, I don't. I don't have one personal. So we have oh, something okay. called the Mosaic Course. The right. Mosaic Course. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, but not in my name. Um, not that there is anything wrong with that. But uh, all I'm saying is that David C. Uh, Kirk was quite impressed with the content rather yeah. than you know normally <laughs> absolutely and i, I would yeah. agree with them like um yeah. how so like this is, seems like a quite a lot of research to kind of condense in a short book like how do you mind me asking like how long from beginning to finish that took to put this all together sure this, you know uh, you know the, the as you see the our uh, the social media and and internet has changed the world now nobody reads a book for information right like you know if you want to study islam or or judaism or hinduism all you need it to do is google it yeah. so yeah. so there is no it's not so much about the research and the information and the knowledge it's funny you said that it's not a 600 page book because any book on world religion it has to be 600 or 800 it's, page book yeah. it's, it's such thick and yeah. dense but now people don't need that anymore. Uh, so what I've done is, obviously I've done all this research. It took around 12 years of you know, uh, learning and teaching on a continuous basis and engaging with people of other religion, you know, uh, reading a lot of books. But what I did was, uh, I think this, was, this is something uh, for tomorrow, I believe, and it's one of the reasons the book uh, is really getting a lot of attraction. So, uh, like you said, my PhD is in film and theology, movies and theology, yeah. um, and that's why I'm here in Los Angeles, right? Yeah. I work with some of the Hollywood. That's my hobby. Mm. <laughs> um, um, some of the productions and some of the film, uh, faith and film dialogue and all that. So, one thing I learned is that is to use a narrative arc. You know, mm. tell this as a story. Right. So, so what I did in the book was. Uh, you know, I'm coming from India. I was born and raised in India. Uh, and uh, I was born in a, a small town called Piravam, uh, which in the local language uh, means nativity or birth. That's what it means. So according to legends and the traditions, we believe that the name comes from the birth of Jesus Christ. Hmm. So this little town in India, according to the legends, they believe that one of the wise men of the East who came to see Jesus was from our town. Wow, yeah. Yeah, so, so if, you come, yeah, if you come to that town, you will hmm. see these two huge cathedrals hmm. dedicated to the Magi. There is a big Christian community over there. Wow. Um, so many people think that Christianity came to India through the British, but hmm. Christianity was there hmm. from first. You, you know this, you know, from your own understanding, but many people, no, even some a lot of people don't know. You're right really know about it hmm. but so anyway so what i did was you know i'm from this town so uh, so metaphorically speaking i'm one of the descendants of the wise men right like yeah. i'm from the town <laughs> so i am inviting them on a journey from the east to the west which is what they took that was their journey they were the wise men from the east right and also uh, so, so in that journey, we go through these different religions right. and we see all these Christ figures, those who look like the Christ they are searching for, but they are not the Christ. Mm. So then they go to the other religion, they go to the other mm. religion, and finally they find the culmination of, of their dream uh, or their prophetic vision in, in, in Jesus Christ. Mm. So, so I use that story arc. Uh, which I believe is what makes the book, you know, you said approachable, readable. It's it's not like uh, jargons and mm -hmm. um, uh, it's definitely not boring, <laughs> I would say. Um, and also, to be, you know, honest with you, 
the wise men of the East to me is one of the most fascinating characters in the Bible because who are they, right? They were not Jews for sure. And they were not Christian, obviously, you know. So, so they were, you know, some people say they were Persians. Some people, they, they are from Babylon. The fact is that nobody knows, right? Mm. But according to Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, which <laughs> used to be the Wiki, Wikipedia when I grew up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, at least one of the wise men was from India. Because the, India is the land of astrologers, they always studied stars. And at that time, India was also part of the Persian kingdom. So it is quite natural that when they are from Persia, they are also, India was part of Persia back in the days too, in the, in the, in the whole um, layout of the land uh, per se. So, so the point being, how come the revelation about the most significant thing that happened in human history uh, which is the arrival of God into this world, was revealed to these people who are outside the traditional Judeo-Christian borders. Mm. Uh, whoever, you know, wherever they are from. So that that gives us a glimpse of, of God is doing something outside our peripheral understanding of knowledge. Uh, but we can use that glimpses of revelation to point them to the ultimate revelation we find in Christ. So... Mm. That's that's a lot there. That's a lot to unpack yeah, there. That's yeah, that's that's good. No, that's really good. I, no, yeah. no. I mean, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, your your book is fresh on my mind. So as you're speaking, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you raise a really, you know, related to what you shared. You really raise a really important question. You know, uh, and then I think all of us who maybe grew up in Christianity and maybe don't have a Jewish background may may have asked this question. You know, is is God a racist? Uh, in light of God choosing the Jewish community uh, to reveal uh, Yahweh, to reveal Jesus Christ eventually. Um, Unpack that for me. You know, that's a huge topic. You know, is God a racist in light of choosing kind of that Jewish community to uh, reveal who God is? Uh, Tell me about your journey in answering this question and how you found resolution. Yeah, that was always the problem I had when I started reading the Bible as a teenager, uh, it talks about the Jewish nation as they are my people, they are my people, and I've chosen them. And I'm like, hey, what's wrong with me? I'm, I'm an Indian. <laughs> like, you know, so what's wrong with the Indians and what's wrong with the Chinese? And, you know, how can God have uh, has his favorites, right? Again, it doesn't mean that I have anything against Jewish people. And uh, you probably know this uh, in India, where the hometown where Kerala, and you, I know you have ancestors from Kerala too, and mm-hmm. Cochin, where I grew up, there was a significant Jewish community out there. So there is a synagogue there. I had a lot of Jewish friends and, you know, they, they are wonderful people. But, but we always wonder, how can God say that they are his people, right? So, so that's where I thought, oh, God is a racist. He only take care of, you know, I mean, he doesn't care about Indians. That's the way I thought about it. Um, but, you know, the, my whole first chapter is, is, is exploring the, the notion of the idea of choosing. You know, it's mm-hmm. very difficult to explain it. But I would say yeah. this, even in the calling of Abraham itself, the very first calling of Abraham itself, it's very clearly mentioned in that calling in you, I will bless all the families of the earth, mm-hmm. which we don't look at it. It, it is the footnote. It's very important. You, you're a theologian and them, you, know, <laughs> you know, footnotes are extremely important. Sometimes yeah. footnotes are more important than the actual text, right? Yep. So the footnote of that calling in every, every aspect of that calling, it says, I'm cho- I've chosen you, but in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So, which really means that we, unfortunately, when we talk about selection, we always consider, associate, there is a false dichotomy of rejection associated with it, right? When we say, oh, the, the Jewish people are selected, we automatically assume everybody else is rejected. No, that's not how it is. Because one group is chosen so that they can bestow the blessing for other people. For example, you are chosen as a professor at, at master's seminary, right? Obviously, that makes you special. But your purpose of you being there is not you. You are chosen for your students, 
right? So in that sense, for the seminary, the students are just as important, if not more important than you as a professor. Right, mm -hmm. but you get the privilege. You get you, you are the chosen one to dispense what the college uh, wants to communicate. But but the more important uh, factor in that classroom are the students, and I'm sure you will agree with that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in that sense, the you know God used uh, the Jewish people as a channel of His blessing or mm -hmm. channel of His revelation to the rest of the world. And I've used some, you know, some stories of a magician and all that. And uh, yeah, in, the boy in the blue shirt, you know, get the yeah, book. The you'll, you'll, you'll get the analogy <laughs> if you get the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a good analogy. That, it's really helpful. I get more emails about that from anybody because a lot of people say that boy in the blue shirt. That story really blessed me. It really, mm -hmm. really uh, helped me appreciate. It's just a one-page story. So yeah, but but essentially, it comes to the fact that uh, God was not just choosing the jewish people in that choosing of the jewish people all families of the earth including indians and the chinese and the all people are included it is very clear uh, actually when you read through that yeah yeah that's good um you know as we think about the role of different religions um i want to bring up another question you know kind of myths yeah. that people believe and so other myths about other religions you wanted to address uh, for Christians to understand? Like, are there, you know, sometimes Christians can have a myth about a, a different religions. W what did you want to articulate in your book uh, to help Christians uh, think through that uh, different, how, how would they understand different religions? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, Christ Again, I want to reiterate the fact that Jesus is the only way. In that sense, you know, Christianity is the only ultimate full revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Having said that, for Christianity to be right, every, everybody else don't have to be wrong. Mm. See, that's, again, the false dichotomy, right? Right. You always say that for Christianity to be right, everything else has to be wrong. No, they can be. For example, if you look at Hinduism, you know, you know, we, we, uh, I'm coming from India. So in, in a sense, you know, I have Hindu ancestors at some point. So in that sense, and I'm going to consider myself a, a Hindu too, right? Uh, but, but when you look at a religion like Hinduism, obviously there's a lot of pagan elements, which is nothing to do with the Bible, uh, which I would say downright evil. In, in so many ways, right? But when when you study, so in that sense, there's a false religious elements to that religion, right? But, you know, nobody gets up in the morning to say that, okay, let me start a false religion today, right? Mm. That's not how, 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 how they start, <laughs> right? You know, uh, you know, Muhammad started or anybody started. No, there was a there is a historical context to it, but more importantly, there was a search for meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, million, uh, uh, I mean, thousands of years ago in India, people were looking to connect with the ultimate reality out there, right? So all these rishis and all these sages would go get up early in the morning and stand in cold water, or you know, and they do these prayers and seeking to seeking for this revelation, right? So. So I believe God has released that primeval revelation for the whole humanity. And it is not that I believe, this is classical theology, my, uh, you know, Romans chapter 120. Mm -hmm. God has revealed himself. We know, you know, the whole idea of general revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know God has revealed himself through nature. Heaven mm -hmm. is declared the glory of God. Mm -hmm. right? And God has revealed himself through our conscience. It doesn't right. matter whether you're a Hindu or a Muslim, we all have conscience. And, uh, you know, what is the Bible says, they became a law to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so the, through conscience, God speaks to us. So in the same way, you know, I believe God speaks to us through work of art. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do in film and theology class. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we look at secular art. In secular imagination, God reveals himself through beauty uh, mm -hmm. in so many ways. So in the same way, I believe, and again, it's not what I believe. There's a theological backing for all yeah, this. General revelation, ideas, sure. General revelation. Mm -hmm. So I want Christians to know that there is there are traces of general revelation in all these religions. 
But what went wrong was, again, Romans chapter 120, as we read, fall, uh, read below, it says, so God revealed himself, but, but then Paul says, they became futile in their speculations, hmm. or they became vain in their imagination, right? Depending on the uh, translation you read. I really like it. So God gives a revelation, then we add on to it. You know, we add our philosophical, we create our own philosophical framework or theological framework. Like Christians, we have 40,000 denominations. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? <laughs> you know, there's only one Jesus, right? But, but because we become futile in our speculations to an extent, you know? So how can we say that everybody is fully right? The only thing that is fully right, the only thing that is the ultimate self-disclosure of God is Jesus Christ, mm. right? So, yeah. yeah, so even when That's we good. say, the, yeah, the Bible is the, is the revelation we have, but then we have this different translation. So we know the word of God is a person who is Jesus Christ. Okay. And the Bible becomes the word of God because it points us to that Jesus Christ. Otherwise, it's just a book. It doesn't yeah. you know, mean anything to anybody. So, so anyway, what, what I'm trying to do through the book and through the Mosaic course is to, to tell the people of other religions, hey, I have no problem believing that you have an element of the same revelation I have. But let me, let me tell you about the fullness of what you're looking for. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it is a very respectful way of communicating the truth. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. You know, no, that's, how, that's very helpful. Yeah. Okay, so those are some myths about other religions. What about myths um, about Christianity? that people of different religions might have uh, about Christianity. Are there, are there any myths that you wanted to dispel uh, about Christianity uh, for people of other different religious traditions that maybe they had a misguided notion about Christianity? What are, is there anything significant that, you know, in this intersection of Christianity and other world religions, and any myths that you wanted to dispel for those of other religious traditions outside of Christianity? Well, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, the main problem with Christianity being connected to the colonial, um, uh, the, you know, we, we, I'm coming from India, we always consider Christianity as a British religion, uh, which it is not because there were Christians in India way before England even, you know, came to existence, right? Uh, uh, this is history. Uh, which, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to uh, to dispel that kind of myth uh, unless people really, because Christianity is more of an Eastern religion, I mean, Middle Eastern religion than it's a Western religion, people know. Um, um, and then the another myth, uh, which, not a myth, uh, but people always think of Jesus as this great teacher, great leader, uh, but, um, but, but I, I really want people to know that, that Christianity, Jesus is not just another religious figure, uh, but he is the incarnation, right? The ultimate manifestation of God himself. And what he did on the cross, uh, and, you know, when C.S. Lewis was asked, what is that one thing that made Christianity a part? And he said the word grace, right? Uh, because only Christianity has this I theology of grace as opposed to all other religions has this idea or the law of karma, right? All other religions, including the so-called Christian religion, operate on the idea of karma. You do good thing, God will send you to heaven. You do bad thing, you'll go to hell, right? That's, mm -hmm. that, that's the, again, that, that's karma. That's exactly karma, even though only the Indian people call it karma, but that's what many our religious understanding operate on. But Christianity presents the theology of grace, you know, where God can look at that man who was crucified with Jesus, who probably raped and killed um, a lot of people. At the last moment, Jesus looks at him and says that today you are going to be with me in paradise. That's where the karma is turned upside down, right? And it happened because of the cross of Christ. So the the uniqueness of the cross of Christ, the, the historical reality of the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, that's to me what makes Christianity stand way apart from all other religions. And the identity of Jesus, not as a human being, 
but the ultimate manifestation of God himself, the invisible image of the invisible God in the book of Colossians, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so this is something I, I want to emphasize all the time when I when I'm on a speaking, in, especially when I communicate the gospel with people of other religions. It might take a while for them to get there, but but I always keep that as my destination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Okay. Um... Obviously, there's so much in this book. You know, you, you deal with various uh, religions, whether it's Sikhism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism. Give me your favorite example of how God reveals himself somehow pointing to Jesus in a different religious tradition that maybe people have never heard of. What's your favorite example uh, of all the ones that maybe you've, you've brought up in this book? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they're all favorites, uh, but maybe pick one uh, of some of the favorites that you had that maybe uh, people in, among, among Christians or maybe even in different, different religious traditions maybe never thought about that. You're like, hey, you should, you should kind of know this one. Oh, um, I'll go with the Hindu one uh, because it's funny. Uh, Faith Today, you know, Canadian magazine, EFC magazine, Faith Today reviewed a good review of this book. Uh, well, uh, actually, they, they did a nice interview, uh, nice uh, review with the caveat, uh, uh, saying that you had to read it discerningly because it's kind of, uh, <laughs> it can be provocative, which it is, but it's a good review though, very good, good. review. But, yeah, in which they have pointed on something I said, um, that uh, in so many ways, uh, you know, uh, Hinduism, uh, say so the idea, because I'm talking about incarnation the word avatar that's why it makes me inter a, a more my favorite because avatar has become such a big word after the movie and even before the movie but not many people know that it comes from the theological vocabulary of hinduism it's a sanskrit word it comes straight from india um, so uh, the word avatar means the descent of god or the incarnation of god so Hindus believe that there are 10 incarnations. There are many incarnations, but 10, full, uh, 10 major incarnations. Nine of them have already appeared, and the 10th is coming at the time of uh, Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And the description of Avdar is very much like the Jesus coming back in the book of Revelation on the horses and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, but isn't it fascinating that Hinduism is the only religion apart from Christianity, that believe in the idea of incarnation. Only Hindus believe that God can come down as a human being. If you say that to a Jew, you know, Jewish religion is supposed to be a parent religion. It's a blasphemy. If you, do, if you say that to a Muslim, it's a blasphemy. No, Allah can never, the infinite God cannot become a finite being, right? But Hindus get that, right? Like that, that's to me is big. So that's one thing about the incarnation. Hindus get that. The only problem, though, they will say, of course, Jesus is an incarnation, but one of the many incarnations. That's where the problem is. But yet, they get the point, right? There is still that, that path they can come to. And the second thing about Hinduism is that there is this whole idea about the blood of an animal can somehow atone for the sins of the uh, uh, of humanity by offering a sacrifice. Uh, so that again is very much connected to the idea, the same thing in, in the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And that's why even Mahatma Gandhi, who is considered the epitome uh, or, the, or the spokesperson of Hinduism in the Western world, uh, described Jesus, I, I don't have the full quote, it's somewhere in the book, but it say, says he is considered, he's the perfect human being who is a ransom for the world. Mm. He, used a the, he used a very Christian, it's almost like Barth or some of these theologians say, mm. ransom for the world. Jesus was the ransom for the world. Now, now that, so, so you have the idea of incarnation, idea of atonement uh, alluded to, at least in Hinduism. Uh, so, so to me, that would be my favorite. Um, but yeah, obviously there are others I've described too. Yeah. Oh yeah. You have to get the book if you want the other ones. Um, okay. Um, so I, I want to bring up maybe some objections that, you know, yeah, yeah. people may yeah. bring up, uh, with yeah. some of the things you, 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 yeah. you bring up here. And so, um, you know, so you, you describe something called fulfillment theology, 
you know, you, yeah. you say this in page 178, the Christ event took place as a fulfillment to the promise of prophetic predictions of all the pre-existing Christian sources, not just the Hebrew scriptures. Um, and so, and of course, you make some connections, of course, with general revelation, right? You've mentioned this already that, you know, God reveals himself to all people at all times. And so, mm-hmm. and one of the ways he would might do this is through nature, through our conscience, and, 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 and can kind of even trickle through various other religions as well and so some people might respond with various objections so i want to kind of put some forward and just kind of hear what you have to say and so uh first one some people may say well you know if god reveals himself through different religious traditions you know why bother with christianity like why not just stay within uh the the uh, the other religious tradition that they belong to oh yeah so the the answer is very clearly as i mentioned uh, you know, the, uh, the call is to the ultimate revelation in Jesus Christ, right? For example, I use an analogy. Uh, so for me, the people of other religion, you know, sometimes I, I dream, when I dream, so I'm, I'm eating a chocolate, something like that. I'm dreaming, I'm eating chocolate. Suddenly, Joanne wakes me up. And I get my, oh man, I was just going to eat half of it and you woke me up, right? <laughs> you, know, I, I, I felt, you know, I'm just making up a scenario. Sure. In reality, I don't even like chocolate, but you get the picture, right? <laughs> so so you, you lose it. But imagine, Joanne wakes me up in the middle of my dream and I open up, I see a chocolate fountain Joanne has prepared for me, right? So to me, all these other revelations which are coming through is like a dream. It's not real, it, 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 but, but I'm saying to you that here is the chocolate fountain, the fullness of God's revelation. And God himself has come down to this world and, 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 and calling you, right? So, so that's where, so if you, don't, if you don't accept that, then there is a problem, right? I'll, I'll use another analogy, for example, if I'm sponsoring a child in India through World Vision or some organization like that. So I write letters to this child and I spend, I send money every week and, 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 and the kid is very happy and the, you know, all my letters and photos, we have correspondence. Then I go to India one day to see the child, you know, just to have a real fellowship with them. And then the child says, oh, I don't want to see you. I just want your letters. And I love your letters. I love the money. I, I love this community. I don't have time to come and meet you. Now, then there is a problem. <laughs> so, so this is the difference uh, between Christianity, uh, the revelation through Christianity and the revelation through other religions. Yes, you are getting some letters. Yes, you are getting some money. But, but then the, the, the giver of this revelation is coming to you. Mm. But then if you say no to that person, then we have a serious problem, right? Mm. Does, that, does that make sense? Of course. So no, that, that's, no. That, that's how I, 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 I distinguish. You yeah. know, that's why I, I want to, I have to evangelize because yeah. Jesus is the way and the right. only way. Without yeah. coming to Jesus, nobody can go to uh, 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 the Father because if there was any other way, it would have been revealed to him at the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Mm-hmm. Literally, Jesus was asking, you know, is there any other way? You know, that, but, you know, but no, there was no other way except Jesus. So everybody has to come to Jesus to go to, the, go to God or, or heaven or whichever you want to call it, right? But, but I'm only saying that, you know, this trickling revelation through your religion, uh, you know, He's actually saying that or bringing you to that one Jesus. Let's come to that Jesus. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah he's, I think he's a language of, it makes you aware, like an awareness yeah. Yeah. Uh, through various religious traditions. But when you, when you encounter Jesus personally, there's a sense of nearness uh, to Absolutely. God and that language. Yeah. And so yeah. um, you bring up the, the language of anonymous Christians, like can, yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, the big debate, of course, you know, that yeah. you're gonna, probably going to get regularly yeah. is yeah. the salvific nature of this revelation. Like, can someone potentially um, be redeemed? Can, can they experience salvation? Can they be with Jesus forever in heaven with that level of revelation? 
that's gonna that, that's obviously gonna be one of the biggest yeah. questions a lot of christians would ask you um, yeah. yeah yeah well um obviously i alluded to some of this uh, fulfillment theology and un anonymous christians in the last chapter just to say that I'm not arguing for it, and if you read it clearly, right, I'm not arguing for any of this, but I'm, I wanted people to be aware of this for further research to find their own, to, to, to find, uh, to make, their, make up their own mind, right? Sure. Uh, so the idea of anonymous Christians is coming from Karl Rahner, you probably know he's a Catholic theologian, and then eventually even um, C.S. Lewis uh, kind of bought into that in, in so many different ways. My personal, uh, <laughs> my personal opinion on that, who am I to say about any of this? Jesus, is, you know, one day I just see Jesus and, you know, he's going to say, who, who taught you all this, right? But this is the way I make sense of it, okay? Uh, I always use stories, you know that, right? So let me tell you the story. It's not a story, but say I have a website, right? I don't have a website. See, this is another problem, you know, <laughs> very bad if you're... <laughs> <laughs> so if I have a website called MatthewPJohn.com, right? MatthewPJohn.com. And uh, there are people who read my book and they really love Matthew P. John. And, you know, they started, you know, they want to correspond with me and all that, you know. Uh, but as you know, my Matthew is written with one T, right? So if I become a popular author, then there is another guy, you know, create a fake website called MatthewPJohn.com with double T. Right. And I'm sure that website will get more traction because that most of the people assume that's Matthew with double T. So anyway, so so there is this there, there is there is this person who really likes Matthew P. John, but unfortunately goes to the other website and the other website is asking for money, donation. This person gives money, donation, all this to this other guy. He's not getting anything. But, he, but this person is thinking that he's giving to Matthew P. John, right? He's actually giving to me. I'm not getting it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, imagine a scenario. Uh, one day I'm sitting at my home. You know, one person walks to me. Oh, this is Matthew P. John's house? Yes. So who are you? Oh, I am a critic of your book. I hate you. I don't like your book. Uh, you know, you are a blasphemer or something like that. I will ask him, get out of my house. I have no communion with you, right? That's one scenario. Second scenario, somebody like, somebody who actually read the book and somebody who knows, uh, you say, Matthew, you really love your book. And, uh, you know, almost like we have a connection. I said, oh, come on in, friend. I want to be your friend, right? That's second scenario. Then comes the other person, the third scenario. This person comes, Matthew P. John, I've been waiting to meet you. You remember me? Like, you know, we have been communicating. I'm like, what? Like, no, I don't know. I don't know. Have I been communicating with you? I didn't really know. But this, but so I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm going to keep that a suspense. What would I be doing? You know, it, in first scenario, it's a clear rejection. Second scenario is a clear acceptance. Like somebody like Josh Samuel comes to my house. You know, he's my friend, you know. He's going to come. You come to my kitchen. You eat from my fridge. That's a connection we have. So that's a Christian to me. And the other one is, a, is somebody who rebels against God, right? Mm. Now, the third person, probably, you know, there is this, that is what the anonymous Christians in that category. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> I don't know what I would do. Because... Because this person still likes Matthew P. John and unfortunately mm -hmm. got tricked by the other, whatever the other is. Sure. So I'm going to wait, Josh, I'm going to wait to answer that question when we go to heaven. Sure. Because I know this thing. You're kind of agnostic when it comes to this question then. Yeah. Well, let me just, let me just tell you one thing, you know, why I hesitate to answer that question. Because there are only two clear instances where Jesus talked about the about the afterlife in the sense there is this one episode where there are people who come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, in your name we did this, in your name we prophesy, pro prophesied. And, uh, you know, then Jesus says, what? I don't even know you. You remember, right? Like that episode. Mm -hmm. Then another episode is the sheep and God, right? People on the right side and the people on the left side. And the people ask, you know, Jesus, when did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? When did we, we see you hungry? Like, you know, but we did that, not knowing. So there also you see a surprise. You know, both instances, one big, one word is surprise. 
there is a there is going to be in in Hollywood language we call it a twist. You know, like uh, you know, M Night Shyamalan movies. Uh, sure. They say a surprise ending. There's a twist. Mm. So the, <laughs> so so all I can say is that I don't necessarily buy into the anonymous Christian ideology. I don't necessarily buy into the fulfillment theology. I have only given it as a as a reference point for people to do their own research. Mm-hmm. But, um, so I don't even know how to answer this question, but I would say that I'm I'm ready for a surprise. Yeah, and we know okay. we both know we go to heaven by grace. So in right. in heaven, nobody earns heaven, right? Right. So <laughs> so we will be looking at each other, saying, hmm, "How did he get in here?" Mm-hmm. That's what heaven is in Christianity, because it's only through grace. Right. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But but Christ has to be the redeemer because salvation right. comes only through christ right otherwise the whole thing happened in the cross and everything is just a fiasco right like mm-hmm. it did. so somebody has to have conscious awareness of it is a completely different question uh for me in my book what i'm trying to use it is to bring this partial revelations in other religions to bring them to the real christ mm-hmm. i want them to come to the real christ because i'm a I'm I'm an evangelist at heart. I want to evangelize people. I want people to come to know Jesus and the cross. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. That leads to uh, my next point. Then would would be relevant is you know speak to someone who's maybe listening that isn't a Christian and maybe they come from a different religious background. Tell me why why Jesus why 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 follow him? Yeah, Jesus will radically reorient your understanding of religion. Uh, So Jesus is not really calling to a karma-based religion, but he is inviting you to a relationship, right? So I have two daughters, Hannah and Emma. It doesn't matter what they do. God forbid they did something really bad. Uh, You know, the whole police and everything is looking for them. It doesn't matter what they do. But there is nothing that is going to stop me from opening my door to my children. Because uh, because it it is the relationship that defines my, you know, their acceptance to my home. So only Christianity, only Christians talk about do you have a relationship with God? Other people think, what in the world does that mean? Relationship with God. So that relationship can be offered only in Christianity. That is brought only through the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's why I would I would say that this is a different paradigm of religion. It's not a do religion, but like Jesus said on the cross, it is done. You know, the 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 price has been pay, paid. I'm inviting you into a relationship. So you don't have to practice religion in fear. Uh, you know, oh, am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? That's not the point. It's not about that. It's about, am I your child or Lord or not, right? So that relationship, that is the beauty of Christianity to me. And that's why Jesus matters. And only Jesus matters in that sense. Yeah. Mm. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, okay. So, We've unpacked a lot here, and uh, there's a lot more to get uh, if you get The Unknown God, A Journey with Jesus from East to West by Matthew P. John. Uh, Matthew, what would be the best way to get a hold of this book if uh, someone listening would like to? Oh, it is. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah, no. it is. I'm pretty sure it is available wherever the books are sold, uh, you know, all the online platforms and all, because it's David Secret, they are publishing it. But I also want to recommend a free resource for the audience, you know. I yeah, mean, please, yeah. Uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, our website, even though I don't have a website, the, our ministry has a website called www.themosaiccourse.org. So we have an online course, so you can understand each religion from a Christian perspective in 20 minutes or less. So wow. that's the way. Yeah. So, and, and it's free. All you need is an email. You, they, they won't ask your credit card. They won't ask your n- name even just an email. So you can just give an email and then log in and do this course for free. Wow. And so it is called the Mosaic course. So the, the companion book that goes with that book is here. It's called the Mosaic. I'm okay. sorry. I, I forgot to send it to you. No, it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Which is actually a study guide for, for that online course. If okay. people wants to do no more, so th- that's like a package, like the unknown God and the uh, the mosaic course. But so the book itself yeah. is at Amazon.com or .ca or okay. yeah. 
So, yeah. Okay, so we'll put links in the description below to get the Unknown yeah. God as well as the Mosaic course, uh, how to you know register online and the course yeah. textbook as well. Um, with the course, so is that like you do assignments or you know just answer questions? Oh, no. like uh, we have developed a very interesting uh, grading system. So there is a fun quiz, uh, you know, so, so it will ask you like seven questions mm -hmm. from six different religions. One is the algorithm will pick up. We have a big database of different questions, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then six different six questions from six religions and one from a general question. And then based on the difficulty level of each question you get, it will grade you. Wow. Uh, so it's like a multiple choice. It's, it's a mm. very fascinating project I developed. And there are a lot of secular uh, academic institutions use it, like, you know, schools, u uh, universities and seminaries. Wow. It's a fun icebreaker to know what you know about other religion. And we have some fun quizzes there, too. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's, all, it's all for free. That's all for free. Okay, no, no not a lot of things in world. No not a lot of things in our world are free right now. So that's pretty. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, make sure to sign up for the Mosaic course online. Uh, I think uh, I'll definitely be recommending that to a, a lot of people because uh, that that sounds like a lot of fun. Very it's interesting. It's fun for seminary students. It's it was really good for seminary students actually. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> we'll put the links in the description below. Uh, be sure to sign up. Be sure to uh, get his book as well, The Unknown God. Uh, I really enjoyed that. You'll be challenged for sure and uh, you won't uh, it's not 600 pages <laughs> it's uh, 200 so it's it's accessible and very captivating and interesting uh, it's so only thank 160 pages or something George the other 40 pages are a lot of notes because of the footnote <laughs> right that's the problem when you do this PhD that you have to give <laughs> you gotta put the notes in there no no I, I like the notes i like it all i like it all i appreciate that so uh thank you so much matthew for joining us i uh, really got a lot of love and respect for you and uh yeah i wish you all the best uh in your journey uh with the lord and you know with the the, the books that have come out you know it's pretty exciting Thank you, Josh. Really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. yeah, it's been rich. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks for listening today. If you found this interview helpful, be sure to share this with others and be sure to like and subscribe Theology Breakdown on your favorite social media platform. Thanks, everyone. God bless. Much love.